I was I was born in in George in the town here, nineteen fifty-two, to uh, Mr. Gabriel Stoffels and Augusta Delpo. Uh, I went to school in George, finished high school here in nineteen sixty-nine and then went to study at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, I'm an accountant by training. And uh, initially, because of the way that uh, society was structured at the time, most of us uh, went into teaching because you could get a bursary. If you wanted to study anything else uh, like engineering, becoming a doctor or an architect or whatever, the, the government did not give you any bursary. So if your parents were poor, then what we used to do is we, you, you then go and you do either a BCom or a BA with a teacher's diploma, come back, teach for four years and thereafter if you want to, to do anything different, then obviously uh, there's no f uh, financial obligation towards the state. Uh, but it, it, we saw that as a deliberate attempt by the then government to force us into certain occupations. Teachers, nurses, social workers. For those occupations, there were government bursaries. And if your parents were poor, then obviously then you had to, that's what you had to do. Uh, I was a teacher for 12 years, taught in George, in Pucklethorpe, and in Cape Town. And then I decided that I wanted to go into the teaching profession, and in, in, into the accounting profession, and I... Uh, managed to get an opening as an article clerk here with a local auditor's firm, Thomas and Parsons. I completed my first degree, my BCom degree through UNISA, and uh, completed my articles in 1983. And when I started to talk to the partners about my future and, you know, possible partnership, they told me that I cannot become a partner in the firm because the registered office of the firm was in the white area. And it was in 1983. So I decided to help with them and then I went back to teaching. And after about four years of teaching, I decided to establish my own small accounting practice. Uh, in between, I also uh, worked as a senior manager with Ernst & Young in Cape Town. Mm. Uh, and before that, I was the national director of small business working uh, in, uh, I think it was a Trevor Manuel at the time, was mm. the Minister of Trade and Industry, and I used to be the national director of small business. Mm. Spent some time in the USA, in the UK, and in Ghana. You know, to look at models of small business and how we can, uh, you know, bring some of the best practice back and apply it here. But they then moved from Mowbray at the Waverley Centre to, I think, Pretoria, and I decided I do not want to live in Pretoria. So I then came back to George from Cape Town and I started my own accounting practice. Uh, and that's what I've been doing since 1998. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, I also serve as chairman of the audit committees of George Municipality and Eden District Municipality. Mm -hmm. And I'm also involved with the NICE Municipality as an ordinary audit committee member. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I'm uh, acting as accounting officer uh, for about 40 NGOs, 
and then I've got about 30 private clients that I serve and then I at the moment I'm studying uh, for a postgraduate diploma in labor law practice to the Nelson Mandela University. Hopefully we, uh, you know, I'll uh, complete that at the end of the year, which will then also allow me to act as a commissioner with the, with the CCNA. Yes. That's sort of work related. I'm married to Elizabeth Kadamayer Stoffels. We have four children, uh, the eldest being Duncan, is 42 now, yes. and I've got eight grandchildren. Uh, three sons, three, three grandsons, and five granddaughters. As I've indicated earlier, George was a very vibrant, talented community. community. Uh, it's difficult to, to, to talk about black because the laws of the country at the time did not even allow African people to work or live in George. Uh, vibrant sporting community. I mean, I've got photos that I brought for you. The people were politically active. My grandfather, Gaja Delport, was uh, a member of the African People's Organization. Uh, with Dr. Uh, Abdurrahman from Cape Town, who was the, the leader of the African People's Organization. And uh, people had businesses. The, the gentleman that you'll be talking to this afternoon, Mr. Edwin McKay, his dad was the local tailor here in George, and he was the last one that was removed. Uh, when the Group Areas Act came, all the colored people were moved from Georgia. They were just... They were I just, mean the, in the central CBD? Yeah. yeah. People had businesses. My grandfather was the only master builder at the time in George. I think he worked on, on this building as well. They used to call it the George Hotel. Obviously there were innovations over the years, but he was... I mean, I've got photos of him where you can see him on site. Uh, with with these artisans and uh, people had an active social life uh, sporting wise the colored people actually dominated sports like cricket and netball and rugby I mean we've got real icons or, you know sporting icons that came from from this area here. and you know, by the stroke of a pen in 1966 or 7, I enacted the Group Areas Act and everybody was just moved. People lost their houses. If you drive out of here now and you go straight to the, to the, to the, to the T-junction here, where you have to turn left to, to, to go to George, that property opposite, where, when, when you stop at the, at, at the intersection there, yeah. The property just opposite that I would belong to my grandmother's sister, uh, my grandmother's sister's father, mm. um, Avi Pedro. Mm. He owned that the, the house, the property. And it's a massive piece of property, mm. and they were just chucked out. Mr. McKay mm. was the last person he refused to 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 move. I think I heard the story that he locked his doors and everything. And they just broke down his doors and, and chucked him into jail and, and put his furniture outside. That was how, it was a period up to that time, you know, I think we had a very industrious and, uh, uh, you know, people had businesses, uh, our schools were very good, the teacher score was of the best in the country. And uh, suddenly our lives changed, just like that. Uh, and like, you know, within Cape Town, with District 6 people moving to the Cape, uh, you know, the Cape Flats. It was like a microcosm of what happened there, happened here as well. Uh, you had to move to virgin land, there were no houses. Uh, there were no community life, etc. And people then had to basically rebuild their, their lives. From, from scratch in, in, from 1967 onward. Yeah. Uh, so it was an uphill battle for a lot of people. Yeah. 
So tell me, the, 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 the removal of people in the central CBD will then remove where to? Uh, people moved. No, not moved. People were forced to move to Pakistan and to Blanco. Yeah. It was just a new. It was like <laughs> new little torpies that 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 that, uh, that were established. And uh, uh, the the the. The police were used to, to move people. You know, they, uh, it was a difficult time. Obviously, you know, at that time, I, I was like, you know, what is it, 14 years old. You had high school, so you, you don't really understand what, what, what was happening. We lived here, just the next row. Our house is still standing there. Uh, because my grandfather was a builder, we had a, a fairly large house here and we were just chucked out and we were forced to move to Blanco. We built another house there. Uh, about ten years later, uh, they decided that the, you know, the colored people must move to the other side of the, of, of the Tard Road that sort of splits Blanco. Mm -hmm. So you left Fancourt on that side, yes. and, and, and you know, yes. uh, so people were moved from yeah. that side where Fancourt is there yeah. to the other side of yeah. the Tard Road. Uh, I see the road going down. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, you had no choice. You had no say in it. You just got a notice from from the government saying that you've got to move because it's been declared a white area. And so so after know, after already building another house. Yeah, he was forced again, and I think that eventually killed him. Obviously, he couldn't he, because you know he was involved in politics and and also understood how the apartheid regime worked. It, it, it was a bit of a sort of pill for him to swallow to be moved for a second time. Uh, and I think that had a lot to do with with the deterioration of his health and you know, that. But it was just a notice. Yeah. You've got to move, and then they give you like a certain period of time. So, is there was there any assistance in terms of saying like, move from the town to Blanco? Now we need to move on the other side of the road. In terms of constructing a new house again? No, 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 nothing. It's nothing like that. Uh, some people. Uh, they gave, you know, they obviously gave people some time, but the the white business people and professional people, they obviously knew that the people were in a tight spot. You know, they would come to you and offer you, you know, uh, some crazy price for your for your house. And what can you do? That that was very difficult. So. That was the period uh, leading up to the Group Areas Act, and so obviously now you have uh, these totally new communities. That cohesion that, that you had, uh, the social life, active social life, active sporting life. I mean, we had white people playing for the coloured, uh, you know, cricket team and the rugby team because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't muster, you know, a full team on, on their own. So. Those people who were really committed to, to, to you know, to, 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 you know, to play rugby or cricket, uh, they had to come and play, you know, for the color teams. You know, we put photos. Uh, so it's not like stories that people are telling or pie in the sky. And, you know, the photos are there to show uh, for the makeup of the teams, etc. So obviously you can you can imagine how if you're being forced out of your home in George, you could have lived in Blanco. The 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 teams and the whole social life is now being broken up. You see, uh, family that's life. a part the, the the family life. Uh, and I don't even want to talk about uh, you know the financial. Uh, 
uh, loss and up till today there is not a single black person who owns a business in Georgia and, and, and what is so striking is that white people seem to think that you know everything's okay the playing field is level and we must move on and forget the past but you know it's kind of difficult you know to forget the past if you, <laughs> if you see what what what's been taken away from you and the people who took it away you know pretends as if nothing has happened uh, and the question in my mind is always if after 22 years there's not a single black owned business in George you know, what have we done? What's going to happen? You know, where are we going to be in 2050? Uh, because the power relations haven't changed. You will see people in black faces and colored faces and uh, at the reception, at the front, and all sorts of places. But the power relations hasn't changed. You know, the management of the organizations, the NGOs, the owners of the business, etc. That hasn't that, that that hasn't changed, not at all. Although it looks like it's changed, it hasn't but really changed. Imagine what the business chamber of George is. There anything that, at least, in terms of involving our people and so on? Look, small business is a very it's not an easy sector of, 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 of business life. Uh, the chairman of the business chamber is Dr. Bernie Solier. Uh, I was the national director of small business and I rolled out the government's small business program countrywide in all nine provinces. And I don't even want to join the, the, the George Business Chamber. I'm not interested. Because people drive narrow agendas. And, and I always, when I, when I used to be a, a senior manager with a small business development corporation in Cape Town, our, our offices were opposite the Goodhope Centre. And I was responsible for the Western Cape uh, information and training, etc. Uh, I often had to answer the question when I say, you know, I've trained 500 people for the year. And somebody would say, but, but out of this training and the provision of information, how many successful businesses have been established? And, you know, maybe you can look at the brochure of the George Business Chamber and they say they've got They've got a, a chapter in Tembaletu and we've got uh, 200 black members. And then you ask the question, but through your intervention, how many successful black businesses have been established and have grown out of, you know, the micro into, into medium enterprise? And there's nothing. So I certainly don't take the George Chamber seriously. Uh, uh, and I don't think I'm bitter about it. I, I know small businesses because the government sent me to the United States and to the UK and to West Africa to look at how they do things. And then I came back and I rolled out this program together with uh, Dr. Alistair Reiters. Uh, he was the chief director. Dr. Avin Naidu, uh, you know, I worked with him, so I've got a fair idea, and I'm a businessman in my own right, so I've got a fair idea of, of what, what, uh, what small business is about. And I don't see the people who, who've got successful businesses, not in George, but in, in, in the greater George region, establish their businesses by their own initiative and drive, not through a chamber or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't want to talk about the chamber too much. I, uh, I'm not really interested in what they do. Yeah.
they've got their own agenda that they're driving. Mm -hmm. But there are no, you, you know, you 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 you'll see people in you know black people in little businesses in George, but they rent from 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 white land uh, landlords, and it's 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 not a racist comment. It's it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. That's the way things are. So I'm saying uh, that the 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 the, the first remover. And the fact that the central business area, the absence of black people in general, it's it's a microcosm of what happened with the first remover. Well, if 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 I if, if I could turn around your question and ask you if my grandfather was one of a whole host of successful coloured businessmen. Uh, when the Group Areas Act came, it meant that they could not operate their business in town because George was declared a white area, the centre of business, the, 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 the whole of the centre of George, up to uh, the peripheries of Pakelsdorp and Rosemore and Blanco was, was declared a white area. So you could not operate your business anymore. So you've got to relocate your business. You see, he was a master builder. He had taxis. Now, if 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 he if if he was allowed to continue operating his business, and uh, his children and grandchildren uh, were allowed to continue operating and expanding the business, uh, we could perhaps have had a lot of black, independent black businesses in George. Eventually, his only son, Dr. Adam Delport, uh, he studied to become a doctor. Uh, he was the, the first colored doctor in, in George. And uh, so his children, they studied at uh, Trafalgar High School in Cape Town. They were successful in, in their various occupations. You see? So I can just imagine, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm only talking about my own family. There are many other families. Uh, you can just imagine what George would have looked like if those people had the opportunity to 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 build on on you know or expand their businesses and then their children and grandchildren you know could also then uh, uh, you know sort of carry on on with the businesses, but it 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 it, it killed off. Black business stuff, and, and I think that was the agenda. That was the that was the whole objective. That we kill off whatever they busy doing, whatever businesses they had, and, and, and we put them on the periphery of the town. So Pakelsdorp and Blanco and places like Rosemore, and they became sleepy towns. You sleep there, you come and work in town, uh, which is not different from. So the modus operandi. Whether it's in Pretoria, whether it's in South End in Port Elizabeth, whether it's in District 6 or whatever, the modus operandi was exactly the same. You see? You take away what they have and then, you know, you force them to come and work for you. And obviously there's the travelling costs and all sorts of things. So the modus, the, 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 it was all over the country. It was exactly the same modus operandi. On top of that, probably, probably one of the, 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 the major apartheid architects was P.W. Butcher, and he lived here. He was the member of parliament for George, and he was the one who then later on, in the, in the, the uh, late 70s, early 80s, he established Pakelsdorp as the first colored municipality in the country. P.W. Puerta, because he was a member of parliament here, and he, he wanted to put that feather into his cap, that in my constituency there we were a, a separate, uh, independent uh, colored municipality, although <laughs> the municipality had to buy even their water from George. And, uh, I mean, they were so, so, they see, were so totally dependent on, on, on George and government grants. So, the the Pakistan municipality was another 
municipality within George. So yes. there were two. No, there was no George. You see, you, you got under. There was no George. Uh, uh, there was no Pakistan in George. Pakistan was when uh, the, 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 the town was proclaimed. Mm -hmm. You know what you call it. Mm -hmm. It became a separate municipality mm -hmm. with uh, uh, the mayor, the deputy mayor, speaker, the town clerk, everything. But, but I mean, they were no, they, there wasn't a single industry in, in Pakistan. There was one big uh, or relatively big shop uh, and two cafes, Mr. Brown and uh, what was the other one, Mr. Sali, and that was it. So everybody worked in, 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 in George. They just slept away <laughs> Pakistan. And uh, that was the model. And uh, that was Pakistan, but it was a separate municipality and the whole you know, country was told that Pakistan is a separate municipality. But P.W. Potan, Trump, he drove that thing. And he handpicked uh, his guys to, to, to assist him, like the colored mayor, the deputy mayor, councillors, town clerk, everything. They had a separate municipal offices, a post office, the works, a clinic, and, and, and that's where you, that's where you lived and worked. The, the, the other thing that, because I was a teacher for, for, for such a long time, for 12 years, I'm, I'm, I'm looking now, I left the, 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 the teaching profession in 1990 to go and work for the Small Business Development Corporation. Our schools were strong. I mean, really, we could compete with the best in the country because we had good teachers. And uh, when after 94, and after unification of the sporting codes and everything, the colored and African kids could now go to the previously white schools, go to Nikwa and York High. So the cream of our schools moved to the previously white schools because obviously uh, the facilities and not necessarily the education but the facilities and everything uh, were better and, and, and they took the cream of our children and, and, and our, our sporting festivals and, and all those things it just died away. So Pakistan has still got the same high school, and there's only kind of uh, kids in the school. Temba led to uh, Imizamu year two, there's only African kids in the school. Uh, Otsinikwa has got a mixture, but still predominantly, I mean, there's maybe 98% of the teachers are still white. You know, the principal is white, same with York High. So, Although it looks like things have changed, it, it still remained the same and, and, and all our bright kids are now excelling academically and sporting wise and in terms of cultural activities. Our kids are excelling, but they're not excelling in Pakistan or in Blanco or in Rosemore. They're excelling at Otenikwa High School and at York High School. Uh, so that, although there were very sort of radical changes. It it did not. It didn't benefit our communities. It impoverished our communities academically, culturally, uh, sporting-wise. So 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 at, at the moment we, we you know we haven't got any role models in, in our well the few that there are, they are really good. You see, I mean you 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 have to be really bright and. and strong academically and sporting wise to be in those schools and still excelling because there are so many negative things that's, that's dragging you down all the time and then obviously I don't even want to talk uh, about the drugs that, that, that came into the, our communities and the schools in that vacuum of uh, 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 absence of the absence of uh, a vibrant social life and 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 you know, sporting activities and, uh, and the cultural activities that, that sort of sustain a community, you see. Uh, 
so the school has lost its sort of dominance in our communities. Mm -hmm. The church has lost a lot of ground. And, and uh, so there's nothing in the center that's holding in our communities. And I, you know, I sort of attribute that directly to the Group Areas Act and, and sort of, you know, the apartheid policies. There's, there's no other explanation for it. Uh, I established a, a, a community newspaper here in 1999, uh, Safe Monitor. When I tried with my own money, and there were four or five other guys that came in to to make people aware of what what was happening around them, you know. And the moment we became overly critical about what's happening in town and the role of the George municipality in 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 in, in not assisting and actively intervening in, in, in you know to 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 assist our people. They just, you know, I think it was the mayor, he just spoke to our, you know, advertisers and then they, and the municipality also took their advertisements out of the newspaper and then eventually after three years we had to close it. So, you know, another sort of voice of the community was just silenced. Yeah. So, what you see in George today, uh, it's 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 exclusion, and uh, there's a lot of poverty. And what is also happening now, which people do not talk about, is that because of legislation, the the the, the farmers in the outlying areas, mm -hmm. uh, legislation has it now that they must share the farm. With the their workers, with the farm workers, mm. and what they do now is they, in very subtle ways and sometimes very forcefully, they pushing people off the farms. And you're sitting in George now with something like nearly twenty thousand people from the farms. From the farms, those people have got no skills, they've got no education, nothing. They now have to compete with, you know, the normal residents of George in, for, for employment, etc. And there's, there's no way in which they can compete because they've got no skills, yeah. apart from the skills that they've learned on the farm. And they now become backyard dwellers and, uh, you know, hobos on, on the streets and all the social ills that goes with that is, is now becoming prevalent in George. And what you see now is that a lot of the bigger businesses in George are now moving out of town to the Meander Mall uh, at the Garden Mall. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you, you see now on a Saturday morning you can walk through Ibernia Street, which used to be the main business area there. You'll be lucky if you see one or two white people in, in Ibernia Street on a Saturday morning. Get into their cars, they go and shop there. Not that I blame them. It's just the way things are at, at the moment. They do their shopping there. The businesses, because you know there's break-ins and people sleeping on, on, the, on, on the front porches of the, of the shops. And the, people are just moving out. And uh, there was an initiative to you know, to, to save the central business district and get people to come, that moved out to come back. Uh, but it, it, it hasn't been successful. People have just moved out. And, and what you see now is a proliferation of uh, foreigners. Uh, because I see, look at the CPD, I see there's a lot of uh, Small shops of foreigners. Chinese, Somalis, Burundis, Nigerians. They, they, they've now come into that vacuum. And uh, so the white people have just moved out. We don't have to, you know. 
where you've moved out, there's a lot of empty space, you know, retail business space in the town, yeah. like never before. Uh, and that's, that's the life now that, 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 that you find here. Uh, I made the interesting comment uh, last year that George Municipality for the last Five years, just before the election, that five years before the election, they had a coloured mayor, coloured deputy mayor, coloured speaker, coloured municipal manager, I'm the chairperson of the audit committee. Um, <laughs> so all the top officials at the George Municipality are coloured, but they do nothing with the coloured people. There's no intervention in people's lives, there's no economic, you know, uh, sort of transformation local uh, economic development. Uh, it, it, it was just interesting for me to, because one day we had a meeting, the five of us, and I was just looking around and I said, <laughs> have you noticed that, that there's no white people here? Uh, we are running, we, we, we are effectively, or supposed to be running the town, the town, but we don't do anything for our own people. And if I'm talking about our own people, you know, the black community, mm. which includes uh, Tembalay to and Lovai and, and, and all those places. But the question arises whether do you have the means for production in your control? Yeah, but, 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 but look, if, if, if you control the municipality, there are ways and means to, you know, there are policies and legislation in place where you can actually drive the local economic development in a particular direction. And if you don't understand that, then my, my, my question is, what are you doing in that position? But, you know, as I say, sporting-wise, social life, everything, we, we've had some of the best in the country coming from this area. Uh, Dougie Carlos, I used to play for Cape Town Spurs. He's yeah. from Pakistan. He used to play for Cape Town Spurs. His brother Derek was 16 when Derek went with Basil Olavira to Kenya to play for the South African coloured uh, 11. Derek was 16 at the time. He was opening batsman. He played with Basil Olavira. They from Pakistan. Yeah, because I remember in the 70s, right about 78, 77. People were coming from George to go and play with the the Southern African College in Oswald. Yeah, yeah. The Malchus people, the Malchus. you know, uh, Desmond and Tony and them. Yeah. I, I've, I've, I've got a brochure here. Sure. The 1954 South African Netball Board. Yeah. There's Susan Prince, who was the assistant secretary. She's from Rosemont. Right. Uh, there's Pete Smith. He used to play for the, this is a 1946 photo. Yeah. Of these 15 guys, six people were, six of these players were selected for, for the South African, uh, you know, colored team. Pete was the best fullback of, 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 of his time. And then I'm talking about in South Africa, not in George. In George. Or in the West, in South Africa, he was regarded as the best fullback. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's like, there's a photo of the African People's Organization of Dr. Abdurrahman, 1939. There's my grandfather, there is Dr. Abdurrahman sitting. Yeah. Uh, this is two copies of the newspapers mm. where Minister Manuel came down to, to, you know, to pledge his support for the newspaper. Mm. So there's a whole host of things. There's Mr. 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 McKay. You see Mr. Yeah. McKay today? Mm. His father standing there. Yeah. Uh, this was in the centre of town. Yes. This, this was a Dutch Reformed church. Just, just to touch on that one, there is a gentleman, sort of a professor, also working in the Nelson Mandela Museum, apparently he's lecturing around sport and so on. He's busy with a, with a, with a, a sort of a sport exhibition. Mm -hmm. And then, according to him, is that uh, there were few current people, but there were no African people. But I didn't want to challenge him. But what I'm trying to say is that there's an exhibition here. Mm -hmm. It's their busy trying to develop. And I said to him, look, 
as far as I'm understanding in this area, they will sport people throughout Southern Cape, George, Mosulbar. I remember the, the roses yeah. in Mosulbar. The, the spring roses, the Mosulbar brothers, the, the two brothers, and Jeffries. the Jeffries, you Jeffries see, who used to compete in also with yeah. the young pirates and so on. Yeah. So I don't understand when you say that there were no sport of color to commun a black community. Yeah, yeah but you see, it's, it's, it's difficult because we, we sometimes battle to you know black then black african mm. african people mm. black african people were not allowed in george mm. i mean so you can't even if you want to you can't come and live in george if your kids can't go to school here yeah. you can't find employment here etc yeah. uh, so up to 1975 or 6 mm. african people were not allowed in george mm. There was no work for them, and everybody understood that there was no work for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was no, there was no African life. Yeah, because in, in that, the southern Cape. In, for, because for example, if you go to Rosemont, you'll find that certain people will change their setting to 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 uh, yeah. Yankees. Mkulu uh, uh, becomes Rodwam, and then you, you get. You get uh, uh, Mabombo become Thompsons, yeah, and, and Lomo become Olifant, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Charlie Susu become Tyson. Yeah. When they come into because yeah. there was a, a and Yasi, Yasi become Jas. Jas, yeah, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so those those are the kind of things that you you, you find in Georgia. Yeah. Because uh, I remember there was a school in urban. Urbanville. Urbanville. Yeah. And that we used to come right about 77, 78, and then we come to play sports there. Yeah, in Blackie's Rosemont. Store. They yeah, used to yeah. call it Blackie Store. Blackie Store, yeah. And then Nathan Lep, who was, yeah. the, he yeah. was uh, probably the only businessman. In yeah, Nathan, in yes. Yeah. Nata. Uh, yeah. I, uh, he was a yeah. very good friend of mine. Yeah. I spoke at his funeral, his wife asked me to speak at his funeral. Yeah, I see where he stays. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in 1970, when I was first year at university of the Western Cape, when I came back in December, I know that Nata took me to his site where he was supposed to build his house. And there was like nothing in Timbalhentu. I mean, it was just vacant land. It was felt. And he was the first one who managed to get a plot from, from, from the... I think that was the, uh, that time the Bantu administration. Uh, Bantu administration, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. He used to get a plot there. Yeah. The way he built his house. Now that was in 1970. Mm. And he was, I think he was probably the one, there was Leo's, uh, there was Mscarpi. Um, Mscarpi, um, yes, yes. Mscarpi um, was here, and mm. then uh, the Lair Puss and one or two other families. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, you know, African people were not allowed in George. Mm. I mean, we all know that the Western Cape was declared a, a mm -hmm. color preferential uh, in yeah. the area, and so that was the law. And if you don't abide by the law, they just chuck you in jail. Mm -hmm. But I should think, with the exhibition in the museum, this kind of information needs to be reflected in the exhibition because clearly. The exhibition in the museum reflect one side of the community. Mm -hmm. Obviously. You see? And therefore, uh, I feel that we need to make that kind of thing uh, known. Because, for example, as historians working within the museums, uh, we know the authorities, but we need to highlight this kind of and say there are people in the community who still have photographic evidence yeah. that begins to suggest that these people, there was false fault in the community, there were people who were well organized uh, in, in, in all spheres of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's... that's, that's yeah. Yeah. Look, the evidence is, is, is there, the photographic evidence, there, there are still people who can relate. Mr. Mr. McKay, have you seen this often? Yeah. Mr. McKay is 80... 81 years old. Mm -hmm. So he knows a little bit more about uh, 
the period in the 40s and so because mm -hmm. he and my uncle yeah. they went to UCT together to study medicine yeah. and then he bailed out later and then yeah. he went to do a, a, you know, a business diploma at, at, uh, at, at UWC or something mm -hmm. yeah. but he and my uncle went to UCT together so he will know a, lot, a little bit more about the the, the 40s and the 40s. Yeah. He'll know a lot more people. Yeah. But uh, some of the history ha has been recorded. It's just that our Isn't history that makes people who run these things uncomfortable. That and you cannot. It's, it's difficult. Look, if you're an African professor coming from Port Elizabeth, this, this, you're going to find it very difficult to, to really uh, understand the, 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 the environment and, and, and the way of life at that time, you yeah. see. Because it's a colored history. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's a colored history and you really have to then speak to colored people and you, you won't find that research and stuff in books. In books. It's with people, it's with photos like this. I put lots of these photos. For example, uh, there's, a, there's a, a gentleman called uh, Mr. Douglas of Dr. Okay. In, in, in Banco. Yeah. It's amazing when he yeah. draw the history of the United Congregational Church yeah. 200 years ago and how he narrated. Yeah. Now that history mm. has, has, has been recorded okay. uh, because the, the, the London Mission Society at the yeah. time, yeah. They, they were active and, and they actually established the, the Congregational Church at the time. Uh, I work from time, from time to time, uh, uh, Dr. Douglas and I belong to the same church. Yeah. Uh, my father was his PT teacher, something like that. So uh, I then, you know, when, when, when after my mother married, we moved to Pucklesdorp. So th there's another Stoffel's history, apart from the Delport history, that uh, uh, that is also well documented uh, from, from, from the Pucklesdorp side because Basically, what you find is that most of the people that was moved to that were moved when when the group areas they moved to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So then Pakistan has got a has, has got a fairly rich history yes. and it's well documented. And Dr. Aubrey Douglas mm -hmm. and Mr. Andy Lamont mm -hmm. uh, they they have good, uh, a fairly good history. Mm -hmm. I mean it. it, it, it it was documented for over 200 years. Mm. I've got some stuff there, mm. uh, names of people and, 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 and stuff of the London Mission Society. Mm. Uh, because it's quite interesting, just from a cultural point of view, mm. Andre Stoffels, my great-great-grandfather, mm. he came from Caterfield here in, in, in the Eastern Cape. He came with, with one of the reeds. There was a Reverend Reed, but, but his son, and they went to London mm. to put forward uh, the whole issue of discrimination by the, 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 the officials of the London Mission Society against, mm. you know, the Khoi people. Mm. They went to England, Andre Stoffels, and, and, and uh, there was one of the Tosa uh, chiefs mm. and this Reed guy. Mm. Now that history, I found it in Grahamstown, in the museum there. Mm. So that is also documented. The photos, the names, dates, everything is there. Mm. And that was also the link with, with, uh, with, with, uh, with Papa's Lord. Yeah, Part of that history lies in Dessel's Lord as well. Mm. Because I believe that Dessel's Lord was also established as a as a missionary, a missionary the, by the German people, yeah, and then, 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 then the the the, the government came and they said that they must <coughs> move from 
the arable land on, on that side of the road. Mm. They put them on in, in the top, which was just a, a rocky little valley there. And some of those people then went further down uh, to Sitsikama, mm. and, 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 but most of them stayed in the Hazel Storm. We know for that. That's right, mm. that's right, that's right. So the history is there. Uh, I, I think possibly what can be done is, is to establish a broader forum mm. of, 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 of people from Blanco, maybe two from Blanco, two from Pakistan, etc. Mm that can link in with this professor and the museum. Mm. But, but then, the, you know, the people from the museum also need to be receptive. Yes. Yes, yes. Not only for, for, for the facts, but also, you know, for, you know, if there's criticism for the role that they have played and yes. still playing, in not advancing, you know, the, the issues. Yeah, because uh, part the chairperson of the museum is a lady called Juanita. Apparently, was the, she was a councillor. I can't remember his name. Was it Solomon's Juanita? Solomon? I think. So. I think so. You know her? I think so. Yeah, I think those are the people that needs to look at the the question of representativity yeah. in yeah. Yeah, and it must be more inclusive. Than yeah. This. At the moment, and I think, uh, I mean, we've got the Nelson Mandela University here now. Yeah. We've got the museum, you know, we've got the the documentary evidence, the photos, yeah. and there's still people alive. I mean, in Mr. McKay is 81 years yeah. old, he can tell you a lot of things. And, and, and you see him this afternoon. And at the same time, there is this expanded public works programs Absolutely. that can assist students in terms of doing more research quickly and things are going forward. But you see you need a you need a champion yeah. that that that's alive to to, to and, and, and has the initiative yeah. and the wherewithal to, to really drive this thing. Yeah. It's no use just sitting here and you know widening your time. That's not gonna help. Mm. You know I, I, I find it very really interesting, they, they've got this, 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 these folk songs of, 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 of farm workers yeah. and, and people sing yeah. Now there's no way in which the white people will sing something like that. Yeah. That comes from the farm workers, yeah. but they've, they've, they've hijacked. Yeah. Our, our history, they've hijacked our folk songs, mm. they've hijacked our Pura Rata, they call it Pura Rata. Mm. But they got that from, from, our, you people. Know, from, from, from our people. Mm. And it's actually a disgraceful so that, 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 they, that they call it their own now. So it's Pura Rata. For example, you know, there's an auntie called uh, uh, Auntie Saloni. And apparently, when I was born, she was the midwife. And originally, she was coming from from Willowville. Yes. Willowmore. 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 You know, I, when I grow up, even at me, my, my, my last sister of 1975, they were, uh, uh, when they were born, they were, they were, they were the midwife was was Ansila. Ansila. Yeah. Was Ansila. You know, whenever they, they, they do the rats and, and yeah, the yeah, smear cool. and whatever, when that child come out from that house, I'm telling you, says Hassan, you will never see people mm -hmm. crossing stuck in a West Bank hospital to no. metal you know And Sila was, the, was, was everything yeah. in the township. Now, my, 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 my dad's sister, and Sarah mm -hmm. Hendricks, mm -hmm. Stoffels. Yeah. She was the midwife in the Papa store. Yeah. And this is now, she died well, maybe 40 years ago, 30, yeah. 35 years ago. Yeah. I took my last grandson now that was born five months ago. Yeah. I took him and his mother to Cape Town yeah. so that Aunt Sarah's daughter, yeah. my, my cousin Mary, yeah. She could smear out my, my, my last grandson. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I physically took him to Cape Town. Yeah. 
So it, it, it's, it's all those things, you know, it's, it's, it's that history, mm -hmm. it's, it's that culture and stuff. And it, it's, it's just be taken away from us. And, and then really, the history of midwives in our township, it's something dead. Yeah, those people. You know, and those were the, the, the real nurses yes. of our community. And that is why today I'm, 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 I'm still alive. Yeah. You understand? And then, and, and, and no one is talking about them. Even the clinics would come to Ancilla's house now. You see, you we'll see two white nurses will come there and, and deliver some stuff to Ancilla. Uh, uh, to the sister. To the sister. Because she, she was not a, 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 a paid nurse. Mm. You see, but he was a, a, a community nurse. Mm -hmm. yeah? That's what they call Ubuntu. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Hey. We had, a, we had a, a, an, an assignment uh, earlier this year mm. in, in, in part of this labor law mm. is about social justice. Yeah. And we had an assignment to, to write about you know, Ubuntu and, mm -hmm. and what it's all about and what it entails. Mm. So it was like easy for me to, without even looking at the book, to write about oh, right. what I think Ubuntu, Ubuntu you know, is. I am because of you. Yeah. Because of what you are. Mm -hmm. And where you've got the shared community life and the empathy and what you're talking about now, you know, the midwives. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no payment involved. It was just... It was a help. Whatever you have, yeah. you will You share. You share. For example, my father was working in a, in a dairy, you know. Now we will notice when my father got sort of this 25 liters of milk and so on, mm. you know 5 liters will go to us. Mm. And Silas house, you know other 5 liters will go there and will go there. Mm. And when yeah. I've got some potatoes yeah. or sweet potatoes or fish, fish, yeah. I will again, you know, share uh, what uh, I share have. That's, what how, yeah. that's how we survived as a community. Mm. So you're talking about what people did when the group areas moved them from forcibly from town to Pucklesdorf and Blanc. That's how people survive. Mm. Because what I have, I share with you, and, mm. and, 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 and so we got by until such time people as there were sufficient funds to, you know, to, to, you know, to rebuild your life. Mm. It's because people, you know, sort of assisted one another. And I'm trying to tell my kids, you know, because if, if I want to give my kids a, 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 a a real understanding of what apartheid was like mm. in its darkest days, then I've got to show them a film like Mississippi Burning. Yeah. For them to understand the gravity and the, yeah. you know the the, uh, the brutality of the regime at the time. Yeah. Because they, they just can't fathom yeah. uh, what yeah. it was like living through those times, you see. And some some think when you, you explain this thing Maybe one is fabricating these this stories and so on. What, <laughs> a million people can't fabricate the same story, you know. That's not possible. Yeah. It's real, it's there. And, and I think because it was so brutal and it was so uh, disowning, mm. uh, and, uh, that's why white people don't want to talk about it, because mm. they feel ashamed. Shame. Mm. Because of what happened. Mm. And uh, we've got this thing now where the white kids say, but I wasn't part of it. Mm. You know, I'm one of the... The born freeze. The born freeze. Mm. Okay, maybe that part of the argument is true. But you have inherited five farms from your dad that was taken away from black people. You've inherited those five. So although you're a born free, I mean, there's no way in which I can compete with you, you see, because you've got five farms, I've got nothing. And, and, and they can't, in the moment you get into that kind of discussion. I was chairman of the SWD Eagles for two years because our company had a share in the, in the, in the professional arm of Southwestern District Rugby. Mm -hmm. And I often spoke to the players and I was trying to tell them, I go to a bank and I've worked hard these past 40 years and I've built up something for myself. So I'll stand in a queue at the bank and when I get to the counter to be out, the lady will, will tell me, yeah, 
Vamekana Gyal. And then the white guy behind me, he can be a bloody hobo. More oom mohandit, lekker beer beter ne? And so I'm, I'm trying to, to, to ask them. And, and, and I, I, I used to tell the, the, the players, because Eric Souls was our coach, he was a colored guy from PE. Yeah. And most of the players, the contracted players were white and they, some of them had difficulty yeah. being coached by Eric. Although Eric was technically very good, yeah. they had a problem and then we had to talk very harshly with them, with them about this thing. And I, and I explained to them that there's a subtle sort of racism yeah. That, that is there and, and it, it shows in the way the bank teller addresses me and the way she addresses the guy. doesn't matter if I'm a millionaire and I'm whatever, in, whether I'm a doctor or an engineer, she, she just sees my color and yeah, but I'm a kind of girl. And then this guy, whether he's a hobo or whatever, more of them, hundred, but I'm a kind of girl. They also had this thing about they did not want to call me a manier. Yeah. He also doesn't want to say um, yeah. so he called me mister. Yeah. Although I haven't taught him at school. Yeah. He doesn't know what my occupation is, but he calls me mister. So we, we experience the term mister as a derogatory term, yeah. which says I don't recognize you. you know? So I'll call him mister. Because I feel comfortable with calling you Mister, mm. because Mister has got some other meaning, mm. uh, or he calls me an underscleriger, mm. because white is the norm mm. and everything else is unders, mm. and and they don't seem to understand uh, that it, it, it's it's hurtful and it's discriminatory, mm. and I, I I look at this this whole issue of decolonization. And although I don't agree with what the students are doing now, and I also understand that there's rogue elements in their, in, in their midst now, I think deep down people are frustrated about the pace of change. And like I'm telling you in George, there's not a single black business owner in, in George. They may rent, they, yes, and what, but they don't own the businesses, really. And then, because the, the, the students are now seeing that the power relations, you know, it doesn't change, it stays the same. Yeah. So somehow uh, we need to break this log jam and, and talk to people and make them understand what you are perpetuating is exactly what caused, you know, problems initially and, and it, it's hurtful yeah. and, uh, you know, they must wake up. Otherwise, you know, we, we, we are all going to go down.